Hello there, podcast listeners. It's me, Bo, your faithful companion in this journey through the world of movie podcasts we call Pick 6 Movies. Let me fill you in on what's in store for you if you are new to these cinematic shenanigans. First, here's the basic premise. My lifelong friend Chad Cooper and I assemble a sextet of movies based around a central theme. Need an example? Well, let's take this season. We call this one Crichton the Middle with You. A look at six movies written by, directed by, or inspired by the work of Michael Crichton. If you can believe it, this is season 21 of this business, and we have come to the very end of it with a look at the Jurassic Park sequel, The Lost World. But before we dive into a scene-by-scene -scene look at what makes this movie, well, not so good, we try to give you a little context with the story about how the movie got made, thanks to Chad's diligent research and a team of frankly terrible interns. So strap in for some prehistoric punishment as we pin the tail on the T-Rex for our final episode of Season 21, The Lost World, colon, Jurassic Park. All right, here we are at the end of our journey, Bertram, the intern. Six movies written or inspired by Michael Crichton. What a long, strange road this has been for you and me, Bertram, and all the other people around here. Bertram, do me a favor. Name three things that you learned while working with me exclusively on these introductions for this season. Number one. Give me one. That's right, because if the interns talk during the podcast, we'd have to pay you some money. What else did you learn? <laughs> Searching for hentai on your work computer is frowned upon. Yeah, even if it's part of, you know, research for a movie introduction. Did you get a call from HR2? After that rising sun incident? Yeah, I got one too, but whatever. There's all kinds of weird stuff on my computer. Give me a third one. What, what else did you learn? <laughs> That's right. Teddy and editing does know where to get the best weed at the best prices. Very good, Bertram. Yeah. You know what? Susan and HR will happily uh, forge my signature on any documentation needed to prove that you were here for a few hours each week to get course credit for your internship, Bertram. And for a season discussing Michael Crichton, we got to talk about one thing, Bertram. You know what that is? That's right. Dinosaurs. <laughs> and there's no better movie to stick a fork in to wrap up this season than the Lost World Jurassic Park. Are you allowed to what? <laughs> are you are you allowed to play the harmonica on an episode? Um, did you listen to the last episode that we did on uh, Runaway, starring Tom Selleck and his mustache? No, you didn't. Perfect. Then, so you're just going to be playing your harmonica and you're not going to be talking? Are you going to come back and ask us for, for money because you played the harmonica? That, then by all means, Bertram, play away. What are you going to play for us, Bertram? <laughs> you, did you really do? You taught yourself the Jurassic Park theme on your harmonica. All right, Bertram. You know what? I couldn't be more proud of you right now. Let's see what you got. Because there is no way that this isn't going to exceed my extremely high and extremely low expectations. Bertram, did you and Teddy get high before coming in? to record with me today. <laughs> Bertram, you're my favorite intern of all time. Let's talk about The Lost World, Jurassic Park. There is no movie, or to be more specific, movie franchise, that is more synonymous with Michael Crichton than the Jurassic Park slash Jurassic World series. Michael Crichton originally conceived the idea of what would become Jurassic Park as a screenplay in the 1980s, and it wasn't a novel. His idea focused on a pterosaur, a flying reptile, being cloned from fossilized DNA. Now, in this original screenplay, he envisioned a graduate student that would genetically replicate this extinct creature, and one assumes chaos would ensue. 
Crichton took his idea and he just sort of let it germinate for a while and decided, hey, you know what? I'm going to take this screenplay and I'm going to turn it into a novel and I'm going to set the story in this futuristic amusement park using most of the same themes from my screenplay, Westworld. See episode one of this season for more on that movie. Michael Crichton wrote this novel from a young boy's point of view who had a front row seat when all the dinosaurs escaped the theme park and started to eat people, I'm guessing. Crichton then sent off his first draft of his guaranteed future bestseller to his friends and his literary agents and the like to get their initial feedback and all kinds of praise of his brilliant work of science fiction creativity. And guess what? Everybody hated it. <laughs> One actual response on this first draft was, why would you write a book like this? Crichton pressed his close friends who read his work on why they hated the book and they really couldn't put their finger on it. They just knew this is terrible and we hate all of it. So Michael Crichton, not to be deterred, he went back and he wrote a second draft. And guess what? They hated that one too. <laughs> as much, if not more, than the first version of the novel. Now, nothing that he did in the second draft made the book any more enjoyable and everyone who read it said, this is crap. So Crichton took all of their feedback and you know what he did? wrote another draft. And you know the saying, third time's the charm? Well, it wasn't here because they all hated this draft too. <laughs> Three versions and they were unanimous in how much they hated his book. Three versions and Crichton was hoping for some sort of validation that I got an idea here that'll work. And finally, one of his readers said, hey man, the story shouldn't be from a kid's point of view. Or to put it another way, I want this story to be for me, an adult. So Crichton rewrote it from an adult's perspective and the reviews were unanimous. This version was also garbage is what they didn't say. <laughs> this version was pretty good. People liked it. During all of this time of rewrite of Palooza, Michael Crichton was working with movie director Steven Spielberg. Maybe you heard of him on an idea for a TV series based on Crichton's script, Cold Case, which was about Michael Crichton's time as a medical resident. Now, this would later go on to serve as the inspiration for the NBC television series ER, starring George Clooney and Anthony Edwards and Juliana Margulies, among many other talented actors. During this collaboration between Spielberg and Crichton on the TV medical drama, Spielberg hears that Crichton is working on a novel about dinosaurs. Crichton's all but finished up the final version, you know, the one that people like, and they started sending out early copies for promotional purposes, and movie studios started getting in line to pay big bucks for the movie rights because the novel, Jurassic Park, was the book that every studio wanted to turn into a movie. Universal Studios won the bidding war thanks in part to Michael Crichton's relationship with Steven Spielberg, who wanted to direct the movie. Coming along for the ride would be famed special effects master Stan Winston and stop motion artist Phil Tippett. Well, they would all team up together and stop motion artist Phil Tippett would step in to help animate the dinosaurs as needed. Then Dennis Murren, who led the design work on the T-1000 in Terminator 2, he came in and said, hey, what if ILM, that's industrial, I, light, L, and magic, M, ILM. What if we came in and worked a little bit of our industrial light and magic to use CGI to animate the dinosaurs with computers? Now computers, that's the C in CGI. G is for generated and I is imagery. That's your CGI. And L is for the way she looks at me. O is for the only one. And I see V is very, very extraordinary. E is even more than anyone that you adore. And Bertram, what were we talking about here? The Lost World Jurassic Park. That's right. All right. So the team at ILM, I stands for, I'm just kidding. I, <laughs> the team for ILM came in and they did a demo of the Gallimimus stampede where the T-Rex is chasing them. And they showed it off to all the bigwigs that were working on the movie and they were dumbfounded at what they saw. 
it was extraordinary and exceeded anything that stop motion could even come close to producing. Steven Spielberg said that the last time his jaw dropped like this was when George Lucas showed him the shot of the Imperial Cruiser in Star Wars. Spielberg took the footage to stop motion effects master Ray Harryhausen and he simply said, well, this is the future. Universal Studios paid $1.5 million for the rights to the movie. Before the novel was even published, Crichton was paid a million bucks to write the screenplay. Other writers came in to condense the novel into a manageable script, including one version that merged the characters of Alan Grant, the lead paleontologist, and Ian Malcolm, the movie's chaos theory-loving mathematician. But the final draft was written by David Kep, which condensed a lot of the novel and made some notable character changes. William Hurt was originally offered the role of Alan Grant, but he said no. Harrison Ford was also offered the role. That would have been good, but he also passed. Ultimately, Sam Neill landed the part. Laura Dern took the role of Ellie after being convinced by Nicolas Cage that everyone should make a dinosaur movie if given the chance. Wayne Knight was cast as the movie's nerdy weasel, Dennis Nedry, after Spielberg saw him in Basic Instinct. <laughs> Although audiences at the time knew him as Newman on the hit TV series Seinfeld, Sean Connery was considered for the role of John Hammond, the man behind Jurassic Park, before the role ultimately went to legendary actor and director Richard Attenborough. The movie was filmed in California and Hawaii in the summer and fall of 1992. Spielberg supervised post-production while filming Schindler's List in Poland. John Williams wrote the movie's iconic soundtrack, as covered earlier by Bertram on his harmonica. <laughs> the movie hit theaters in 1993 and became the highest grossing film worldwide at the time, exceeding the box office of E.T. The movie made $3.1 million on the Thursday night screenings alone. It pulled in over $50 million in its first weekend, being the first movie to generate 50 million bucks in a single weekend. And it was estimated that the movie sold over 86 million tickets in the United States during its first theatrical run. That's like one ticket for every three people in the US at the time. Now, when a movie is this popular, it makes this much money, there's just one thing that you gotta do. Bertram the intern, what is that? You're damn right, Bertram, you make a sequel. Now, when it came to making a sequel to Jurassic Park, everyone turned to Michael Crichton to whip up the goods. Fans wanted a sequel, movie producers wanted a sequel, but you know who didn't really want a sequel? Michael Crichton. Because he felt like there was a problem. Well, there were a lot of problems. First and foremost is that in his novel, the island gets blown to bits by napalm. And also John Hammond, the kindly old man behind Jurassic Park, well, he dies in the novel. And guess what else, Ian Malcolm, He's also dead in the novel. So Crichton kind of found himself painted into a literary corner of sorts as it related to the source material. On top of all this, Crichton never penned a sequel to any of his novels or his screenplays. The sequel to Westworld, which was called Future World, it didn't really involve Michael Crichton at all. And Crichton acknowledged that the biggest challenge with a sequel is that it must be the exact same as the original, but still be different. So Crichton, based on the demands of fans and movie studio executives with giant sacks full of money, he went back and looked at Jurassic Park, the novel, and he realized that he only implied that Ian Malcolm was dead. So it was possible to bring him back from this implied death. Because Crichton had an idea for a sequel, and this sequel centered on the character Ian Malcolm. The sequel of the novel Jurassic Park would be titled The Lost World as a tip of the hat to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's novel of the same name. And the new novel would include similar plot points like an expedition to a faraway land to search for dinosaurs. When does the tip of the hat just become the removal of the hat where you just stuff it full of other people's ideas? You know what, I'll let other people <laughs> figure that one out. The, <laughs> the novel The Lost World hit the shelves of bookstores in October of 1995 just in time for the Christmas holidays and it debuted at number one on the New York Times bestsellers list and stayed at number one for eight weeks. And it actually stayed on the bestseller list until March of 1996. Reviews of The Lost World, the novel, were mixed. People Magazine wrote, it's action packed and camera ready. Did we read it? Of course not, we're People Magazine. 
The New York <laughs> the New York Times said it was a tired rehash of the first novel, but what did everybody expect from a book that was written because the movie based on the first novel was such a success? The novel's plot is set shortly after the events of Jurassic Park, Ian Malcolm, who did not die, goes to Isla Sorna, a secret Site B where the company Ingen bred and raised the dinosaurs before heading over to Isla Nublar, aka Site A, aka Jurassic Park. That apparently was all that Steven Spielberg needed to hear about when it came to the actual book's plot. Spielberg was ready to turn this book into a movie sight unseen or unread, and the adaptation of The Lost World would be a very loose adaptation, to say the least. For starters, the movie begins with a scene from the original Jurassic Park novel that was left out because Steven Spielberg felt it was too intense for the original film's opening. There are also scenes from Jurassic Park, the novel, that were not used in the first two movies that ended up making their way into Jurassic Park 3, but that's a different story. Let's get back to the adaptation of The Lost World, the novel, into The Lost World, colon, Jurassic Park, the movie. As mentioned earlier, John Hammond and Ian Malcolm were both killed in the original novel, but in the book, Crichton said that Malcolm was only mostly dead, which is partly alive, so he got to come back. But in the movie, John Hammond and Ian Malcolm did not die, so bringing them both back for the film wasn't as big of a stretch as it was in the book, although Hammond isn't in the book because he's 100% dead in the original novel. You sticking with me? Great. The movie cast Julianne Moore to play Sarah Harding, Ian Malcolm's ex-girlfriend who gets stranded on Site B looking for dinosaurs. This isn't how it works in the book. It's actually a paleontologist who goes to Site B to prove the dinosaurs are real, and Ian Malcolm goes along to shoot down this guy's theory, but that's neither here nor there. The novel has two kids that stow away on the mission. These kids were mashed up into one kid who the filmmakers decided, hey, what if this kid was Ian Malcolm's daughter? That'd be fun because absentee parents is a spice found in most Steven Spielberg movies. Vince Vaughn was cast to play Nick Van Owen, an environmental saboteur of the expedition. This character isn't in the novel at all. Speaking of characters in the movie that aren't in the book, how about the movie's main bad guy, Peter Ludlow, who's John Hammond's nephew? He's not in the book. And in the book, when everybody lands on Isla Sorna, they stay there. And the final act of the film adaptation of The Lost World, where dinosaurs run amok in San Diego, that is 100% not in the book. So you may be asking, how is there such a disconnect between the novel and the movie? Well, reportedly Steven Spielberg and David Kep were discussing ideas for the movie a year in advance of Crichton even finishing the novel. And David Kep plucked what he wanted from the book to add to the ideas that had already been decided on by he and Steven Spielberg. The film was shot in Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and New Zealand, and at Universal Studios Hollywood. The movie had a budget of $73 million and a staggering $250 million as its marketing budget, with over 70 promotional partners including Burger King, Seagram's, Hamburger Helper, and General Mills introduced Jurassic Park Crunch Cereal for parents who don't give a shit what their kids eat for breakfast. There were toys and candy and plush dolls and more stuff that would eventually end up in a landfill, all associated with the Lost World colon Jurassic Park. The movie opened in May of 1997 in 3,281 theaters and ultimately expanded to over 3,500 theaters by its fourth weekend. It made $72 million its opening weekend, making it the biggest opening movie of all time at that time. And it was the first movie to hit $70 million over its opening weekend, surpassing the original movie's financial benchmarks. And it held these record-breaking titles for four years until Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone debuted in theaters in November of 2001. Critics praised the movie's advancements in special effects and its ability to convincingly make extinct animals come to life, but as Pick 6 movie critic of choice Roger Ebert said of the film, it can be said that the creatures in this film transcend any visible signs of special effects and seem to walk the earth, but the same realism isn't brought to the human characters who are bound by plot conventions and action formulas. Ebert's partner in crime Gene Siskel said of the film, I was disappointed as much as I was thrilled, because The Lost World lacks a staple of Steven Spielberg's adventure films, 
exciting characters. Even in the original Jurassic Park, the dinosaurs, not to mention the human beings, had more distinct personalities than they have here. Save for superior special effects, The Lost World comes off as recycled material. And it's just like Michael Crichton said, it's the same, but it's different. It hits all the right beats, but it feels like an imitation of the first movie's originality. The success of The Lost World, colon, Jurassic Park, did lead to Jurassic Park 3, and then years later, the entire franchise was continued with Jurassic World and its two sequels. It's impossible to deny the cultural impact and wild popularity of the Jurassic Park franchise. The most recent film, Jurassic Park Dominion, seems really to end the franchise in a place that it's kind of at an impasse. But hey, if they can resurrect extinct dinosaurs as well as characters killed in early versions of the Jurassic Park canon, who's to say that if a reboot of Jurassic Park in the multiverse of making cashness isn't sitting on some screenwriter's laptop right now? I, for one, hope that they make more Jurassic Park movies so we can review them on this podcast to see if they're any good. And speaking of dinosaur movies, we need to discuss this one to see if it's any good. So let's get Mr. Bo Ransdell in here to discuss this, the season finale of this season's theme, right in the middle with you. Bertram the intern, slap that harmonica in your pile and play us out of this intro. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Raptors and Rexes, Big Six Movies proudly presents The Lost World, colon, Jurassic Park. Bertram, you're the best intern ever. And I say that to every intern. <laughs> Give Bo in here. And welcome to Pick 6 Movies. I'm Chad Cooper, and I'm joined by the man who always moves in herds, Mr. Bo Ransel. Bo, how are you doing this evening? Oh, fantastic. I, I like to think that I'm the Boasaurus Rex <laughs> of this podcast. <laughs> Let's just start with what this series has devolved into. And I don't mean Pick 6 Movies, although that's a discussion for another time. With legal counsel nearby. I mean the Jurassic Park phenomena, because you mentioned in your introduction that you... Th- think that this series is maybe they'll do another one which whatever um (laughs) i think there is exactly one good jurassic park movie this isn't that one it is the first one i think i think it is a good movie maybe even a great movie i think you said at the end of our last episode it's a good movie but it is a flawed movie sure i think there was a better movie that could have been made in jurassic park i never really cared for sam neill as as dr alan grant i thought he wasn't as strong of a protagonist i I would have loved to have seen harrison ford in that role Mm -hmm. i think that would have brought a greater star power and i get that the dinosaurs are kind of the stars of that movie so it's okay to have a supporting cast of people that are just running around shitting themselves and screaming as dinosaurs try to eat them. But I will say, I've got a son who grew up with the second wave of these movies and watching the first three. I think that they are what they are. They're fun monster movies. It's silly fun dinosaurs chasing and eating people. If that's what you paid for, then that's what you get. I think that the downfall of the Jurassic Park series and Jurassic World series really starts with this movie where every movie has to one-up its predecessor. Mm -hmm. It's like you had one T-Rex, we got two you've got the supersaurus we got the megasaurus we got the two-headed megasaurus we got the killosaurus rex (laughs) when the jurassic world movies introduced the indomitus rex Mm -hmm. i was like i'm done check please waiter i've had my fill of this but i mentioned to you we haven't discussed this but i recently saw the jurassic world dominion movie well that wasn't good that was a mistake i saw it because i went to see it with the kid and i said here's here are the movies that are out right now Uh we can go see dinosaurs or we can see tom cruise and jets and you're a little too young for the other movies that i want to see right so you know we ended up watching dinosaurs and he loved it yeah you know but also because his brain is mushy and malformed right so as a adult human being watching the movie i was like this makes me sad i like most of these actors and seeing them in 
this material. Which, by the way, the biggest problem with Jurassic World Dominion is most of the movie is about a bunch of stupid bugs and not dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And that's a big mistake. And they also don't capitalize on the revitalized superstardom of Jeff Goldblum. Oh, absolutely not. Yeah, he's kind of the comic relief, but he's kind of the comic relief of this, too. Yeah, it's it's strange. Uh, He's definitely more of a side dish than he is a main course. Yes, and I think Jeff Goldblum can absolutely carry a movie. You need look no further than the fly for that sure. where he's amazing and vibes naturally transylvania six five thousand earth girls are easy the list goes on and on <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know the he's kind of squandered in these movies because he's not really allowed to be weirdo jeff goldblum which is the jeff goldblum that i really love jeff goldblum that everybody loves that whole jurassic world series and again i'm just too old for them i think like they are meant for people who don't understand how movies are supposed to work they don't understand traumatic action and therefore they're gonna be fine with like oh look that dinosaur ate that guy yeah i understand those are for me and i would have seen it had it not been for the kid i also saw minions rise of Gru with him and that was way worse but i saw hotel transylvania one two and three in the theater it just hurts your heart you don't want to tell the kid like when when you come out of a movie like hotel transylvania or jurassic world dominion and they're like that was great you don't want to be the ass that's like what is wrong with you what you say is what did you like most about it what was your favorite part you just start asking questions because they're not going to ask you they're selfish asshole kids they don't care yeah i said what i always say when i come out of the movie i say get in the trunk so i can drive you home i'm always like blow into this stick so that i can start the car (laughs) (laughs) i had a little bit too much daddy juice in the theater weirdly we saw the trailer we'll get to this stupid dinosaur movie in a minute we saw the trailer for that new movie the woman king is this the one that is wakanda for never the one that is not a black panther movie but is about like these female warriors in africa and he was like i really want to see that and i was like totally That looks like a much better movie than anything we've seen together so far. So yes, we will go see The Woman King. Let's talk about The Lost World colon Jurassic Park. Speaking of things that come after a colon. You know, we we touched on this earlier, Bo, but this is not a good movie. Oh, no. The entire thing just feels like a series of set pieces stitched together. Like a Roadrunner and Coyote cartoon. You know, but instead of starting off in the desert and then repeatedly kicking the coyote in the dick for seven minutes, this movie decides to just endlessly introduce characters who one by one get eaten by dinosaurs or just disappear from the movie altogether Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah p puzzlethwaite just takes a powder at a certain point which i i respect it's amazing how many characters are in this movie and that there is not one story arc to be found nobody grows nobody learns anything nobody really does anything in this movie except scream and run away from dinosaurs yeah and it opens shed <laughs> on the ocean and there's this like slow rise from the waters to reveal an island shrouded in clouds and we even get an insert here that says this is Isla Sorna, mm-hmm. 87 miles southwest of Isla Nublar. Then I had to remember like, okay, well, Nublar was the one where Jurassic Park was. Got it. Okay. Right. And then we get the title right away, yeah. which I know made you happy. Absolutely. I mean, we're kind of five for six this season. That's pretty good. That's the best average we're ever going to see, I Look, think. Look, and let me just say, in defense of Jurassic Park 3, that's a movie that don't bullshit around at all. You are getting people attacked and eaten by dinosaurs immediately. Immediately, like when the movie sets up, but they get William H. Macy and Tay Leone and Sam Neill. They hit the island like within the first eight minutes. There's no bullshit. It is the Lethal Weapon 2 of Jurassic Park 3s. I haven't seen that in a very long time. Joe Johnson directed that. Uh, he was the Rocketeer and Captain America, the first Avenger. Okay. And that Wolfman movie we did. <laughs> yeah that was a stinker but he i guess he he's he's most famous for having directed honey i shrunk the kids there we go yeah that's kind of what put him on uh map so which is kind of shocking we haven't done that movie yet but (laughs) perhaps one day so we see this family of privileged rich assholes 
And they've parked their yacht off the coast of this island, and the waves are cresting at like six to eight feet. But let's assume that the weather was nice a little earlier, and now it's getting choppy. And so we got a mom and a dad and their daughter, and they have this crew of about like 10 to 12 people who, despite the handsome salaries that they must be receiving, resent their employers with the intensity of a thousand burning suns. Especially Jeffrey, who gets called out by name. Jeffrey, bring the sandwiches over, Jeffrey. Dude. You know, he's like, oh, I spit in every one of these on the ship. <laughs> the patriarch of this family. He's got this dyed black hair and he's sitting this handcrafted sandalwood beach chair with white pillows to support his entitlement. And he's reading, you know, the Wall Street Journal because he's an important businessman. And these waves are crashing in the background of this desolate island. And he just commands his crew to go visit this island because, oh, it looks quaint. What? Why would they do this, Bo? I want to eat on that beach. Uh, yeah, that's going to be a lot of trouble. And I said, I want to eat on that beach. Dude, one of these crew members removes this bottle of Perrier Jouet champagne because only the finest will do when you're trespassing. And this champagne is being chilled in this sterling silver champagne ice bucket. Yeah. And so their day drinking is being served in the finest crystal and their wife is there. And you're like, well, the only way she's not being cheated on by this asshole is if all of the family's money comes from her side of the family. <laughs> <laughs> Deirdre is their daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Because the mother's giving some reasonable shit to her husband about like, you know, she's going to go wandering off and he's just like, oh, we can make another. Deirdre, go wherever you want. For the mom tells her not to wander off. And then he corrects the mom to say like, yeah, just do whatever you want. The daughter then turns and looks at her mother and goes, you're so annoying. This mom gets no respect in this family from her husband or her daughter or even the crew. And then there's a wide shot, Bo, of this table that's set up with chairs. There's a linen table cover. I swear to God, there are flowers in a vase uh -huh. on the table and a sun umbrella. How there wasn't a hot tub, professional croquet court, and just a couple of horses in the background in case somebody wants to practice their equestrian handling skills is a real mystery to me, Bo. A croquet court had already been set up so that they could play the most aristocratic of games after eating their crudite and but so this little girl goes wandering off into the jungle barefoot put on some shoes and the mother was like there's probably snakes and shit in there and the husband's like <laughs> snakes in a jungle oh don't be silly You've been reading too much of your Lewis Carroll. <laughs> but instead of snakes, the little girl runs afoul of a little compy is the short name for them. The little, you know, rat lizard dinosaurs. Oh, hello. What are you? Some sort of bird? Bird? This looks nothing like a bird. Yeah, she's rich people smart. It, it doesn't have wings or feathers or a beak, which are the three things that are required for a bird to be a bird, you ding dong. She's terrible. Well, but she doesn't have to be smart because she's rich and she's not first generation rich where she's the one who came up with the idea to make the money or whatever. This is all inherited money. She doesn't <laughs> like this is the Paris Hilton to be. She tears off a piece of her pate and shaved gold sandwich and she gives it to this compy and it takes a nibble. And then all of the compy's friends show up. And long story short, they all attack this little girl. Cut to her parents being quite put out to see the crew have to run off to save their daughter who is yelling for someone to come save her life. And everybody runs over and the little girl's screaming and the mom and dad follow begrudgingly. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're probably just going to chastise their servants for not topping them off before they ran off to <laughs> save the screaming kid. Uh-huh. And the mom sees the daughter that had to look like a sloppy spaghetti dinner at this point. I mean, yeah. Like, the the kind of thing that if you didn't have as much money would definitely get DCS <laughs> called on you. They'll pay their way out of that for sure. <laughs> The mom then screams, cut to Jeff Goldblum standing in front of what we will soon find out is a photo of a blue sky with a green palm tree behind him. And he's out of subway station and the screech of the train coming by blends with the scream of the mom. And so we transition from the previous scene into this scene of one unpleasant sound to another unpleasant sound all at the same time. It's an odd transition. And when I saw this movie for the first time, in theaters 
many years ago, Bo. Mm -hmm. This was the moment that I knew the movie was going to not be good. Those were good instincts, Chad. And I didn't even have you beside me to lean over and go, this is going to suck. Really? Yeah, trust me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I I don't think I saw this in the theater. I think I may have gotten wind of this just from the trailers. It made so much money. It was the highest grossing movie until that first Harry Potter movie came out. People are fucking stupid. Yeah, it, you need look no further than... Fast and the Furious, everything? Well, no, it, George, it's George Carlin who said, think of how dumb the average person is and figure half the people are dumber than that. I know. And that tells you all you need to know about the way of the world. Yeah, so Jeff Goldblum gets on this subway car and there's this hipster guy staring at him and it's like, oh, I recognize you. And Jeff Goldblum doesn't really say a word to the guy. He's just looking around realizing that other eyes are on him the guy says i believed you jeff goldblum oh so we're starting from the premise that nobody really knows that jurassic park was a thing and he's been discredited and is a bit of a pariah yes so he shows up at john hammond's house the spare no expense guy from the first movie who decided that he was going to be in this movie about five minutes more than i was when he shows up at the mansion a real classical ask jeeves type butler opens the door and this butler says who shall i tell mr hammond is calling what this butler doesn't recognize jeff goldblum from jurassic park (laughs) <laughs> like the guy on the subway knew who he was. Jeff Goldblum was Ian Malcolm in the first movie. How would this butler not know one of the three principal characters from Jurassic Park? Why wouldn't the butler say like, oh, Mr. Ian Malcolm, Jeff Goldblum. It's good to see you. It's been too long. Please come inside. But no, he's just like, who in the fuck are you, sir? Yeah, and he's paid not to know people, you know? Jeff Goldblum walks in and those two kids from the first movie show up for a drive-by and you immediately think hey i don't remember kirsten dunce being in jurassic park and i got you know what a lot of people make that mistake see it's not kirsten dunce that's ariana richards see she was in jurassic park and she was in tremors and then she was in that underrated teen theme movie angus and some other stuff she was in tremors 3 in 2001 but now she went on to just be an artist who paints so good for her but i kind of think that every art show that she goes to people say hey that's the girl from jurassic park and people say hey that's not kirsten dunce you're like you know a lot of people make that mistake or they see her and they're like i loved it when you kiss spider-man upside down like that (laughs) right (laughs) and she says thank you would you like to buy one of my paintings no thank you (laughs) i just wanted to tell you how much i like spider-man jeff goldblum sees the two kids from the first movie and he awkwardly hugs them and he says tim tim lex lex it's uh it's it's great to see you uh your grandpa called me do you know what it's uh about is everything okay blink once for yes and twice for uh mostly they're pretty quick to get out of the movie they just uh, sort of sidestep behind him it's kind of like trump in that second home alone yeah they just sort of walk past him as he's coming into the big fancy house well they tell him everything isn't okay with john hammond uh what what do you mean everything isn't oh uh okay they are kind of tight-lipped about it and then we meet ludlow yeah who jeff goldblum recognizes but the rest of us in the audience are like who's this guy again yeah because he comes down with a bunch of people in suits ludlow is played by arliss howard and spielberg tapped him again to play former u.s vice president john c calhoun and amistad which came out the same year that the lost world colon jurassic park hit theater yeah he was also private cowboy in full metal jacket you know i like the idea that steven spielberg did both of those movies in the same year because you could really tell which one he cared about <laughs> and spoilers <laughs> it wasn't this one ludlow comes down the stage and he says well if it isn't jeff goldblum here to share campfire stories with my uncle john hammond the man who built jurassic park in the first movie he's my uncle did i say that well that makes me his nephew and then ludlow goes over and he signs a bunch of documents to show that he's got you know authority over the operation and jeff goldblum says uh you can tell the washington daily pecune or skeptical inquirer all you want but i was there and uh i know what happened and so do you uh <laughs> Yeah, and Ludlow says, 
John Hammond will soon be out of the company. I'm in charge of engine now. Also, I'm the villain. Were you getting that from me? Because I'm very much the bad guy in this movie. Uh, yeah, uh, you covered up the death of three people and stuffed disinformation down the public's uh, throat. Uh, you made me look like a nut and destroyed my lively uh, hood. Uh, just wait to see what I do with dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> Ludlow says to him, I heard your university revoked your tenure for telling these wild stories and taking bribes and for eating other people's lunches from the break room, Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> I uh, uh, did not have uh, lunch money. Uh, I, I, I didn't eat Judy's leftover chicken almond uh, casserole uh, or the tiny biscuit that was in the container. Uh, uh. That's not what Judy said, and thanks to an NDA, you can say nothing against her. Engine the company is now my responsibility, and I shall defend its interests to the utmost. I report to the board of directors, not my kindly uncle. In a few weeks' time, though, your problems will be moot and forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Jeff Goldblum heads upstairs to talk to John Hammond, who's lying in his very fancy bed looking sick and old. You were right! And I was wrong. Did you ever expect to hear me say such a thing? Ho, ho, ho. Thank God for Site B. That was the factory floor. We bred the dinosaurs there and then we moved them to Jurassic Park. It really doesn't make any sense, but this is a sequel and it's the best that we could do. Also, a hurricane hit Site B and we just let the animals run loose for shits and giggles <laughs> to see what happened. Now we have a complete ecological system that's been there for four years. That's how long it's been since the first movie came out. Jeff Goldblum rightfully asked the question, but John, John, uh, why didn't the dinosaurs die because of the uh, lysine deficiency? <laughs> That's a wonderful question. They should be dead, but they're not. They're flourishing. I've heard tell that some of them can shoot lasers out of their eyes. There's a flying green one who can talk, and he hangs out with a strange man named Pee Wee Herman. I've seen him on the telly. There's also a large purple one who sings and dances with children and teaches them of love and happy families. It's quite a delight. That's why I organized an expedition to go there and document everything. The animals won't even no people all there. Look at this monitor. It shows all the carnivores stay on the interior of the island, so the team will be safe on the outer rim. Don't worry, I'm not making the same mistakes again. Uh, no, John. John, no, you're making whole new ones now. Uh. That's the best line of this movie. His delivery is, it's almost worth watching and then turning off the movie at this point. <laughs> yeah, There are a couple of good Jeff Goldblum moments in it because he's just a good actor and he's really interesting and charismatic. And when he's on the screen, at least you're interested in what he's doing. And it's crazy because they don't use him that much in this movie. I mean, he's in it, but he doesn't do anything. Yeah, he's so much of an observer in this film. It's it's really frustrating. But here, Goldblum recaps for the dummies in the audience what's going on. And he says, uh, John, John, so there's a second island with dinosaurs with no fences. And you want to send people in and uh, uh, these people will be uh, on the ground to d document what's happening. Uh, who are the lunatics that you're wanting to con into doing uh, this? Uh. And he says, well, I've got Nick. He's a video documentarian. Then there's Eddie. He's a guy in charge of equipment and a paleontologist. Then I want you to go. And Nick, he likes to go by the nickname Vince Vaughn. <laughs> and Eddie, he prefers to be called Richard Shift. And the paleontologist, well, homina, homina, homina. We'll talk about her. I mean, him, them, they, a little later. Stay away from this folder. Then uh, Hammond tells him, oh, yes, there was a girl that almost got eaten by tiny little dinosaurs <laughs> from a yacht. Turns out we're going to owe them a lot of money. She would live with the help of multiple machines pumping blood <laughs> through her body and, you know, <laughs> other machines that inflate and deflate her lungs 24 hours hours a day with medical staff to oversee her health care the health care of what's left of her upper torso and the stub that she calls her remaining arm i'm quite happy she cannot see for her eyes were plucked out from her skull nor can she speak or let's be honest scream as her vocal cords were torn asunder from her throat like the innards of a halloween jack-o-lantern but because the board has taken control of my company uh, jeff goldblum it's only a matter of time before this Lost World, that's the name of the movie, 
is found and pillaged. Yeah, so what he wants is for people to go in, get photo records of the dinosaurs, and basically take it to the public. So the public sees it and is like, oh, we can't let people, I don't know, exploit the island, question mark, because we want to keep all these dinosaurs safe, question mark. All of those question marks and 10 more. It's like... I need to send people to the island so that dinosaurs can chase and eat those people for a movie. <laughs> the one we're in right now. <laughs> he says, oh, Jeff Goldblum, this is our last chance at redemption. And Jeff Goldblum says, uh, John, John, not just no, but hell no. I'm uh, <laughs> going to call everyone on your list and tell them not to uh, go. Jeff Goldblum, I, I didn't want to tell you this, but Julianne Moore. She plays a new character on our movie, and it turns out she's your girlfriend. She's a paleontologist, the world's greatest paleontologist. And she went to the island because we could get Dr. Alan somebody and Ellie What's-Her-Face to come back for the sequel. <laughs> there wasn't enough money on God's Green Earth to get them to star in this film. Also, she's been working at this animal park in San Diego that will come up later in the finale of the movie. <laughs> right. She's already on the island, and she's going to meet the others in three days. Now you have to go, Jeff Goldblum. Tally-ho! Enjoy the research operation! <laughs> Jeff Goldblum says, John, John, th this isn't a research expedition anymore. It's uh, a rescue mission. Then the movie has the balls to just lightly sprinkle in a couple of bars of the original theme from Jurassic Park, which is crazy. Because that movie theme is as iconic as anything that John Williams has ever written, and they don't use it once in this movie. Yeah, uh, although John Williams did the music for this, and there are some good moments in the score, but it is absolutely nothing like the actual Jurassic Park score, which is truly one of the best scores of any big-budget action movie ever made. Jeff Goldblum immediately goes to Richard Schiff and is like, uh, uh, why aren't you uh, working with President uh, Bartlett right now? And he's like, ah, because I'm building this stuff. And I'm also complaining about how our timetable got moved up. Also, J Julianne Moore's satellite phone uh, isn't working. And that could be for all kinds of reasons. Maybe she just turned it off. Also, did I happen to mention to you that next week is my 25th wedding anniversary and my son's 10th birthday? Also, my daughter's pitching in the big softball championship game next week. Next week's one big week in the old Schiff household. Can't miss any of those big events. Only way I'd miss any of those is if I got killed violently. But what are the odds of that? <laughs> <laughs> Where are you going? Oh, baby, baby, I think it's time for me to show up in this movie. Yeah, I'm, so I'm the photographer, Vince Vaughn. Uh, and look, I can tell you, I've been doing combat photography. I've been working with Greenpeace because, baby, those women are money. 80% women in Greenpeace, and I love every single one of them. So what do you say? Let's get this show on the road. Uh, I, I took pictures in, in the jungle in Bosnia, Rwanda, Chechnya. If there's an A at the end of it, I've taken a picture of it. All right, baby? All right. This is going to be great. You know what? Uh, Hammond's check cleared, and now I'm going to go down this wild goose chase. And Jeff Goldblum says, uh, this is the only wild goose chase where the goose chases, uh, you. And for the record, every time I've ever been around a goose, the goose is a total asshole and chases everybody. This movie introduces us to a character at this point that is 100% not needed in this movie, which is Jeff Goldblum's daughter, Kelly. Yes. Now, we gotta talk about a couple. Mm -hmm. Number one, Jeff Goldblum as Ian Malcolm. He has this daughter from like his ex-wife or girlfriend i'm not sure which but kelly is black mm -hmm. jeff goldblum is a white guy now i don't have a problem with jeff goldblum being a white guy and having a black daughter the fact that he has a kid needs to be addressed and it isn't addressed at all and in watching this movie again the first time i don't know why i have such traumatic memories of it it reminded me of ghostbusters 2 when dana barrett shows up and she's got an infant son and you're like when did this happen and with who? Because in this movie, not the issue of him being white and his daughter being black. I'm just, we dealt with the whole black-white issue of parents and children in that Fantastic Four reboot that we did a few seasons ago where Sue Storm was white and her dad was black and her brother was black. And that's all well and good. But I kind of feel like when you make that sort of casting choice, you need to address it somehow. Like, it would be no different if the person they cast had a thick British accent or Irish accent. It's like, you need to sort of explain what the hell is going on 
here. I think you are having the same reaction that somebody in the movie does because there's some ADR from somebody when they see Kelly and Jeff Goldblum together at the same time where someone says, yeah, I see the family resemblance. It's Vince Vaughn. And you're like, why is he bringing up the issue that this pasty white guy has a black teenage daughter? I wasn't bothered by the difference in their skin color. I was bothered by the fact that you just took this character you have a teenage daughter what yeah i mean the move is you make it his kid with julianne moore who is his ex-wife i've got a whole section of notes on that she goes to the island daughter shows up to stay with him they both go to the island everybody ends up together as a happy family they're not doing shit with the book you are 100 percent correct it's a really strange term but yeah so kelly shows up and he's like uh, Kelly, Kelly, you're uh, supposed to be staying with Karen. Uh, Bugs Karen. Right. And I'm like, is that the ex-wife? Well, no, because he says the ex-wife went to Paris and dumped this daughter with him. She also says that she scrubbed out of gymnastics, which is going to come into play later. To your point, he does tell her, kind of yells at her when she's mouthing off to him and says like look i'm uh uh not the one who went to paris and dumped you on me then he kind of <laughs> realizes what he said and he's like uh kelly kelly uh my best advice to you as a parent is not to uh listen to me this whole time richard schiff is barking at jeff goldblum over the pa system like jeff goldblum get down to the main floor quit bullshitting jeff goldblum to hell with your daughter please get down here we've got business to take care of she doesn't matter to the movie jeff goldblum she has no role in this film whatsoever she does not change the course of the movie in any way can you get down here please i argue you could edit her character completely out of this movie and i don't think it would disrupt the narrative of the film one bit yeah and it's it's not the actor's fault like she's fine no. in this it's just it's the just bad ride yeah like she just doesn't have anything to do other than be scared or to have a kid in a movie that kids are gonna go see that's what it is which i was like look when i was a kid i saw raiders of the lost ark i wasn't like you know what this movie really needs it needs somebody i can identify with like no <laughs> you identify with the heroic adult characters imagine how shitty star wars would have been if you had a bunch of kids running oh wait never mind <laughs> yeah yeah i think we know the answer to that I, it's why it, i didn't like last crusade because it starts off with a stupid indiana jones kid that's not what i'm there for i want grown up ass indiana jones punching nazis in the face do you remember that you and i saw last crusade in the theater together but not together that you were there with your dad and i was there and the movie broke two or three times i don't remember that but that sounds completely plausible it seriously broke like two three times to the point where i was like this is bullshit in fact i went out as like you know whatever fat fingered kid and was like i want free passes like this is unacceptable and then they gave me some yeah i think my dad just periodically snuck over to buffalo brady's for their pitcher sized <laughs> margaritas hey i'll be right back i'm gonna put this rock in the door don't move it <laughs> yeah this, this is my lucky rock <laughs> lucky in the sense that it's going to be sort of my sobriety <laughs> test if I remember it's there. If you need a ride home, go get that fat finger kid. He's got some free passes. Y'all go see another movie. Isn't that your fat little friend Chad up there with his dad? <laughs> so if I just slip out, it's cool, right? My dad wasn't there. He dropped me off. I'll be back in two hours. <laughs> right. Give or, give or take. <laughs> Richard Schiff, though, does show off this high hide, which doesn't matter to the movie either. It's only there to stick the character Kelly who doesn't matter in this box so that you're not asking, hey, where's his daughter for 20 minutes of the movie? Yeah, so bad. <laughs> and so then Jeff Goldblum is like, uh, Kelly, we are uh, leaving in three hours. So uh, we'll see you later uh, or never again in the movie. Either way is fine uh, with me. Kelly wanders inside of this rolling laboratory for their research. And it looks like two fancy Winnebago's that are stuck together, tip to end. Mm -hmm. And then we cut to a wide shot of a cargo ship, which now has the two aforementioned Winnebago's on it. There's a couple of Jeeps and they are headed towards Isla Sorna or Site b where it's safe if you stay on the perimeter don't go to the inside and then the driver of the ship says he wants to unload all of the equipment at the shore and he doesn't want to go up the river because the locals call this the five deaths 
which mm-hmm. again that doesn't mean anything yeah and vince Vaughn is like baby that that name is so money i love it i love it we're gonna get people <laughs> all over the place to come here the five deaths are you kidding me we have the five deaths cigarettes we have the five deaths drink we have the five deaths resort you're gonna love it baby it's gonna be amazing have i ever told you how much i dislike vince vaughn yes i dislike vince vaughn the same way i dislike jennifer aniston and the fact that those two made that movie called the breakup that was the most repellent movie i've ever seen advertised <laughs> A movie that specifically designed to keep you away from it. If it said, and a special appearance by Alex Trebek, I might have just burned down the movie theater <laughs> to prevent other people from seeing it. <laughs> so they make their way onto the <laughs> island. Oh, by the way, if you if you want to know what will turn me off of a movie, just watch that Fletch Confess trailer. Everything about that tells me I'm not going to enjoy that movie. <laughs> and I And I think what I discovered when I watched it is I don't really like John Hamm. Really? Yeah. I as I was watching I was like I don't like him in this role and everything he says makes me mad. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway so we get to the island where all our heroes are trying to track down julianne Moore. i mean we're ripping through the jungle at this point they find her torn backpack uh-huh. with the satellite phone inside which is what they were tracking oh shit she's dead then they hear something big moving through the brush and we get yeah. kind of the the moment of awe of of the first Jurassic Park of like oh here are the dinosaurs uh huh and it it's just a bunch of stegosauruses wandering by this is where Jeff Goldblum says oh yeah uh ooh ah that's uh how it starts and then there's the running and the screaming and it's a pretty good line again a good Jeff Goldblum delivery that's the second best line but I do want to point out that we are about twenty five percent done with this movie and we've only seen dinosaurs twice which kick it up a notch the lost world colon jurassic park and also the big reveal of the dinosaurs in this sequel is just so lackluster when compared to the reveal in that breathtaking experience (laughs) that was the introduction in jurassic park to here it's just like quiet cattle crossing yeah it's like bertram's harmonica rendition of the jurassic park (laughs) theme it's like all the pieces are here but this doesn't feel right at all there's nothing majestic about this it's just no i I expected one of these dinosaurs to just like stop and fire hydrant piss into the river Like, well, oh, <laughs> what if, if one of these dinosaurs had like tucked front and back legs together and taken a dog style shit? <laughs> oh, this would be the best movie I ever saw. <laughs> yeah i i agree <laughs> like, what is it doing i uh uh don't know and then just, <laughs> just a big old cow shit only stegosaurus sized oh that would and be then, right and then you do a call back to the first movie and you have jeff goldblum say that is a big pile of shit right yeah that's how you please the audience is <laughs> that's let's, how you please me yeah let's see these dinosaurs start pissing and shitting but anyway, so Vince Vaughn is following after the Stegosaurus to take some pictures. And wouldn't you know it, there's Julianne Moore taking pictures also. Yeah, she's like 20 feet over there, Bo. <laughs> right there. <She's>, it's... <laughs> They're right on her. And she sees Jeff Goldblum and she's like, ah, I'm surprised that you agreed to come. Hey, you're never going to believe this. I've almost proven that dinosaurs rear their young for a long time. And also, I figured out that thing that John Hammond said at the beginning of the movie about why they didn't all die like uh, we said they would in that first movie. And it's because the herbivores are eating lysine-rich plants like soybeans, and the carnivores are eating them, so they get lysine. Uh, So it's all tied up. uh, uh, We get it, Julianne Moore. You're an expert in uh, dinosaurs. And so she's following the stegosauruses around and gets close to a baby stegosaurus, which she's taking pictures of while Vince Vaughn is doing a video of it. And he's like, baby, you you look so money. Look right in the camera. Oh, baby, you look great. You're all gross up and you're all gross up dinosaur <laughs> and Did you see that movie fred claus with him and <laughs> giamatti you had me at giamatti you lost me at vince vaughn giamatti's santa and vaughn mm-hmm. plays his brother who is that movie for 
Hey kids, you want to go see Paul Giamatti as Chris Kringle and Vince Vaughn as his alcoholic, no good, shipless brother? That sounds awesome. Look, Christmas Eve's right around the corner, and these fucking elves won't even finish their goddamn work. I, and if one more person <laughs> to ask me for goddamn Merlot for Christmas, I'm gonna burn down the whole fucking North Pole. What do you want, Vince Vaughn? What we're brothers? Huh? That's as close as I'm gonna get to ever seeing that movie. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's the movie I want to see where Paul Giamatti is just at the end of his rope from the beginning, like he is in every movie he's ever been in. Uh, but anyway, so Jeff Goldblum is like cracking wise about Julianne Moore. Like, look, uh, uh, Julianne Moore, she just has to touch everything. Look at her trying to grab the dinosaur. Just touch. Why is she reaching under? Oh, oh, oh she's uh, she's 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 giving him a, a, a rub and a tug, uh, apparently. You know, if she wanted a sample, I could uh, uh, get it for her. Vince Vaughn and Richard Schiff, here they admit that they didn't actually expect to see dinosaurs on this expedition. Like, what? And then we get this low temperature action sequence that's not very <laughs> thrilling where julianne moore runs from dinosaurs and she hides in a log because what she takes a picture and then the camera goes rawr, 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 which spooks them yeah like you said this is a real low temperature that's a great way to put it of the stegosaurs whipping their tails around and it's kind of over as quick as it happens there's a lot of that in this movie he, although here julianne moore does set up the finale of the film by saying some science guy said the t-rexes were rogue they're loners they're rebels do you understand me Dottie? and they abandon their young even when they crowd in pain during an atmospheric thunderstorm i think i can prove otherwise based on the screenplay's ending vince vaughn is like baby i'm winning, winning the pulitzer with this thing go ahead close the options everybody go home i got the pulitzer <laughs> julianne moore is like listen jeff Gold bloom i was tired of being out there studying rocks and bones and when i could be here studying the real thing while they're all sniping at one another richard schiff is like hey is that smoke from our base camp and they all go running they show up at the strung along winnebago and kelly pops out and she's like sorry i was making breakfast for everybody what so she <laughs> right. stowed away on these winnebagos yeah. and traveled across the ocean for presumably at least a day or two. Or maybe 15 minutes. This movie does not do a very good job of establishing how long it takes to get from here to there. Yeah. Vince Vaughn says to Richard Schiff, hey, baby, you notice any uh, family resemblance between these two? And, and this is the moment where you're like, is that racist? Yeah, I mean... I don't know. It it doesn't make any sense that there is so little explanation given. And again, I guess, you know, if we're living in a more enlightened world where it's like, well, of course, it doesn't matter if her mother is black. It, like you said, it would just be nice if not if he was like, well, this is the child that I share with my black ex-wife. But just explain, like, where did your daughter come from? What's your backstory? Because in the entire first movie, you didn't mention that at all. And now you show up and you got a kid. You've got an ex-wife, a girlfriend and a child all in this movie when before you were just a playboy fucking anything goldblum says uh i've, I've got to come up with a plan to get my daughter back to the main uh land uh, uh and he runs inside this winnebago and you get to see where kelly was hiding for her multi-day trip across the ocean and it looks like a dumpster there's just food wrappers and empty bottles and trash everywhere it looks like the aftershocks of a high school kegger yeah and he makes a comment about it too uh kelly kelly this uh looks like your room in here uh julianne moore follows him in she gives him shit about coming there to rescue her and she makes the, a good point here which is hey look when i need you to save me from a dinner with your parents that you didn't show up to or this function i didn't want to go to you're nowhere to be seen and i appreciate you riding in uh, on your white horse but uh, uh, also uh, i don't need you right now uh uh, uh. Yeah, and so, it, I mean, what you are setting up in the movie that never really pays off is that he's kind of an absentee parent, and he's sort of absent in his relationships. I've never seen that in a Spielberg movie. Right, but it doesn't ever come to anything. There's no resolution. He doesn't right. learn anything! I mean, he doesn't do anything! He doesn't learn to be a good dad or a better boyfriend. He learns how to drive a car and yell at people on a phone? Basically, I mean, unless you're going to call the last scene of this movie sort of like, oh, look, they're all together. 
together like what him his girlfriend and his daughter who is presumably going to live with her mother again like you need that moment where jeff goldblum says kelly i uh uh was never there for you but i'm here for you now or the same thing to julianne moore but we don't get any of that so yeah it's it's a real mess as you were saying that i forgot that kelly the daughter shows up in the final scene i thought that she exited and went to live with (laughs) yeah he he gets out of this movie too yeah (laughs) it's crazy the last 15 minutes of this movie feels like it's totally tacked on like it 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 feels like such yeah. an afterthought but anyway a swarm of helicopters yeah shows up flying in the air and they're all marked with the engine logo they got these cables dangling down holding on to jeeps and trucks and then our movie's bad guy ludlow he's leading this expedition to capture and then presumably sell dinosaurs to keep engine in the black And then the movie starts this parade of new characters that will one by one be eaten by dinosaurs, starting with Pete Postlewaite, Mm -hmm. who is our big bounty hunter. Or he was kind of, what, the fake Kaiser Soze in The Usual Suspect? That's right. He takes over that role of the middle-aged, bald, big-game hunter from the first one. He's got this number two, played by Peter Stormare, Mm -hmm. who we last saw in Armageddon. He was that dead-eyed heavy from Fargo that was running around with Steve Buscemi. Yeah, the crazy one. He's been in a ton of stuff, and he's a good character actor. He's good at playing the nutjob wackadoo. Yeah, one of my favorite performances is actually from the game until dawn where he plays sort of the crypt keeper of that video game and he's amazing i'll take your word for that one it's really good it's him we've got ted nugent jr who is their own personal paleontologist type who is the one to explain dinosaurs to the rest of these idiots and the audience where'd that guy come from you look at him you're like oh this is gonna be a guy but he's not he looks like a muppet that came to life the other thing that they introduce in this movie that i realized that terrible ghostbusters afterlife ripped off the extendo arm yeah they have these little sidecars that slip out of the jeep so they can shoot tranquilizer darts at these dinosaurs and whatnot which is crazy because it really impedes their ability to aim like they're bouncing all over the place oh well sure it's not practical but at least it looks all right it's kind of a neat visual to see these jeeps kind of running along with these sidecars sticking out and stuff that's kind of fun yeah but the whole scene is here just to show that we got a group of violent assholes looking to capture dinosaurs at any cost right and so our heroes of the movie are on this bluff looking down on this all shaking their heads and tut-tutting like can you believe that ludlow and his people are here to steal these dinosaurs we get a couple of moments with these guys where pete postlethwaite for example sees this t-rex track i'm going to go kill it yeah well and he tells ludlow he says i'll find your tyrannosaurus Taurus, but uh on one condition you can keep your money i want to kill a tyrannosaurus rex the greatest predator the world's ever known and a buck a male one with a penis one that i can see a big penis then we get this moment with peter stormare where he's approached by one of those little compy dinosaurs and he has ted nugent jr hey what is this thing <laughs> ted nugent jr is like oh man that's a little coposaurus those things are pretty cool and he's like is it dangerous it does not seem to be afraid of me no man they're cool as hell like you can take them and you can train them to like be your buddy they're just beautiful sweet tiny creatures their nickname compi uh in swahili that means god's green angel Uh uh-huh uh-huh how about i do these to it and then he takes a little cattle prod and just zaps the shit out of this thing yeah (laughs) i'm gonna go tell my friends you're gonna regret that mister (laughs) why are you so mean to dinosaurs and so so pete postlethwaite ends up finding in about two seconds this tyrannosaurus rex nest that's got a little baby tyrannosaurus rex at the bottom of it everyone look over here i found a baby t-rex i think we can use this to my advantage Bring me a second gun. Fill it with ammunition. AJ, P. Postlethwaite's partner. What's going on with that? Dude, I think this movie just doesn't have the balls to say that they're a couple. Right? Because it feels like it's implied, but it's like, then don't imply it. Just let that be the thing. So they find this baby T-Rex and they capture it. And it's over like eating this other rotten carcass of a different dinosaur. And then the plan is that they're going to use the baby T-Rex to lure out the mommy and hopefully daddy Mm T-Rex. 
And then we cut to this baby T-Rex and it's tied up yeah. and it's staked to the ground, just screeching out in pain while Postlethwaite and his <clears throat> friend hide in a tree covered in camouflage. Our band of heroes, they find bad guy base camp. And Vince Vaughn chimes in, hey, baby, baby, look, it uh, it's, turns out that I'm actually special ops, baby, baby. And John Hammond, he sent me in to blow up these bad guys using my special ops skills, baby, baby. We understand, like, all these Ludlow guys are going to take dinosaurs back to the mainland. And Ludlow is in the midst of a Zoom meeting where he's like drunk <laughs> yeah look we've got a jurassic park that we started building in san diego unfortunately uh john hammond was a useless old withered prick and couldn't finish it so in less than a month we can have this up and running and we're gonna steal a bunch of these dinosaurs did you uh, in a minute i'm gonna take the camera around you're not gonna believe it your eyes are gonna pop out of your fucking skulls <laughs> we got dinosaurs here and we're gonna take them to san diego and set up our own Jurassic Park. John Hammond, did I mention that he's a worthless old wrinkled shriveled prick? Because he is. And he had this whole vision about people coming to the island and scholarships so that poor people could come look at them. To hell with all that. We're bringing all these dinosaurs to the people. We're showmen. And... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Excuse me. You're saying that John Hammond... Yes. The wrinkled old prick, yes. Before he dreamed of Jurassic Park yes. on an island, he built an amphitheater yes. on the waterfront in San Diego, as you you call it yes san diego and then he just abandoned that into this grander vision yes well it, it was going to be the world's largest flea circus mm -hmm. right yeah um none of that happened because the permits alone to build this monstrosity would have been prohibited you don't build something like this in san diego <laughs> and then just abandon it the property value of the land is unimaginable. No one's going to approve a dinosaur zoo in San Diego. Hello, Department Services, City of San Diego. How may I help you? You're reanimating dinosaurs from fossilized DNA you extracted from mosquitoes in amber? Oh, that sounds fantastic. Mm, none of that's going to happen. Have a good day. Goodbye. Click. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's quite dumb you know what's crazy man is that at the end of this movie they have built this outdoor amphitheater that looks like a mini jurassic park mm -hmm. in san diego excuse me diago and it doesn't matter why would you even do any of this it is so poorly thought out how did steven spielberg pretend to direct this movie <laughs> i kind of picture it uh if you remember the movie jay and silent bob strike back uh-huh where they visit the set of the sequel to Goodwill Hunting. And at one point, either Ben Affleck or Matt Damon asks Gus Van Sant for direction. And they cut to him and he is just staring at a stack of money on a table in front of him, counting it. And is like, yeah, 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 sure. Do whatever you want. I imagine that it was like a reverse poltergeist where Spielberg said he was directing it, but he brought Toby Hooper in to really do all the heavy lifting. <laughs> right. And this is what you get. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know what? I will challenge that and say that if Toby Hooper had done it, it would have been way more fun because it would have been a Coke fueled <laughs> fever dream. Like a movie like Life Force or something. And this is just boring. Our heroes go down and let all the dinosaurs that were captured loose. So about this time, a Triceratops just comes crashing through bad guy camp tents and just starts a whole series of mayhem to destroy this camp. And then somehow, Bo, a Jeep explodes, mm -hmm. catches fire, flies into the air, and then crashes down on Postlethwaite and his boy toy, who leaped to safety. And then Postlethwaite walks over and gives shit to Stormar and he's like that's the last time i leave you in charge and then stamari he genuinely looks kind of sad well sure yeah i mean uh, would you want to be dressed down by pete postlethwaite hell no no he's terrifying his head's really got a weird shape yeah it's like one of those potatoes you don't buy and you're like i'm sure it tastes good but look how strangely lumpy it is well <laughs> it did not anymore chad <laughs> <laughs>
Vince Vaughn runs over and releases the baby T-Rex that's all tied up. And there appears to be a bottle of booze next to the T-Rex. And according to the internet, this bottle of booze is there because Ludlow, our villainous drunk, earlier in the movie in a scene that's not in the film, he staggers over, trips, and falls on the baby T-Rex, breaking its leg, which is why it's got a broken leg bone. Oh, okay. Yeah, all of this was left out of the movie because they didn't want somebody like me to come sue him because it was a lot like Thanksgiving in my house 1990. Here, you got that idea from my dad. Yeah. <laughs> and Bo's dad. Yeah, especially my dad, yeah. <laughs> We're both going to sue you. Punitive damages. <laughs> we want free movie passes. <laughs> And gift certificates to Buffalo Brady's Wooden Nickel Pub. Don't make me throw my dad's lucky rock at you. So Vince Vaughn is like, come here, T-Rex baby, literal baby, and throws this thing (laughs) in the Jeep. Uh, and Julianne Moore sees this and is like, oh boy, Jeff Goldblum's not going to like this. You're like, wait, Jeff Goldblum, he's in our movie? Where is he exactly? Right, what's he doing? Are he and Kelly just hanging out? <laughs> the answer to that is, uh-huh. And <laughs> Pete Postlethwaite then goes to Ludlow, and Ludlow's like, how on earth did this happen? And Pete Postlethwaite says, we're not alone on this island, Ludlow. Mmm, friends. Friends of friends. Well, I didn't bring enough booze for everyone. <laughs> Goldblum and his daughter, they run back to the two Winnebagos that are attached tip to tail, and Goldblum gets on on the radio and he says uh this is jeff goldblum and i'm here with my daughter uh kelly kelly we are seeking immediate evacuation from this island uh over is this what people say uh on these types of radio devices uh yeah and there's this woman on the other end that's just like que 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 se enrique donde esta el gato <laughs> donde esta la biblioteca <laughs> habla du fromage <laughs> <laughs> and, and Jeff Goldblum <laughs> kind of wraps up the... Tu nombre es jefe Goldblum? Eh? ¿Qué? Four years of Spanish. Two high school, two college. Well done. You're welcome. Yeah. yeah it's you. It, it feels like the podcast has really <laughs> gone international now. Como se dice, Ed Asner is a hoot. The silly Spanish <laughs> I know to this day. <laughs> So Julianne Moore and Vince Vaughn show up after Jeff Goldblum gets nowhere with this woman on the radio. and Because he doesn't speak fans. Right. Like me. And they've got this (laughs) baby T-Rex under their arms. And they just throw a belt around its mouth to muzzle the thing up. Hey, Bo. Uh Uh-huh. You know what they should have done with that baby T-Rex? Leave it. Chunk it in the river. (laughs) Yeah. Done and done. Right. What is with this? Like, we got to save every giant lizard predator that we run across they're all over the place now look man i love animals i'm not an asshole but if i'm on an an island full of dinosaurs that are going to come eat me because i have one that's screaming in pain chunk it in the river i didn't break its leg that's what we call an act of god (laughs) it's an act of ludlow (laughs) you didn't break its leg like you didn't knock this thing out of a tree like a baby bird and now you've got to nurse it back to health with an eyedropper right this is that's it movie's done yeah. you know what if they had just chunked this baby t-rex in the river mm-hmm. then everyone else wouldn't die and now chad the needs of the many <laughs> way the needs of the baby t-rex with the broken like that's not gonna set right oh especially when th- this is held together by literal gum yes and julianne moore <laughs> is doing this like ultrasound on the leg because they brought ultrasound <laughs> equipment apparently in case one of them got pregnant on the trip (laughs) kelly of course is freaking out so jeff goldblum is like uh kelly uh we are gonna go into the uh high hide and so they go up to this high hide they start to hear a roar coming through the jungle and one of the better moments of the movie is them hearing this roar and seeing the trees below them move as they're above the canopy yeah you can mark the best scene of this whole movie starts right here Uh uh-huh and then i'm gonna say it ends when they pull everybody up off the cliff absolutely this sequence in the middle is you know it's it's them trying to one up the original t-rex attack in the first one and it is very very well done yeah it's the thing i remembered most coming back to this movie i remember this sequence very well it's absolutely fantastic but it's also interesting you know when you watch this to see how technology has changed and the way filmmaking has changed so if you've never seen this movie i don't think we need to describe the whole sequence it's kind of like describing the finale of the lone ranger it won't do it 
justice. Mm-hmm. Do you want to kind of walk through the broad strokes of what happens here? Yeah, so Jeff Goldblum runs back to the trailer. The Tyrannosaurus Rex parents show up to get their baby. At first, it looks like they kind of let the baby off of the bus and are like, good, all right, we're done. But the T-Rexes are like, ha <laughs> To hell with that. Let's go back and get these assholes. And it's two T-Rexes because the first one had one and this is the second one. So we got two. Absolutely. And so they start knocking the trailers off the edge of this cliff. And so eventually everybody's kind of hanging from seats and straps and that kind of thing. The best part of it is Julianne Moore falling to the bottom of one of the trailers and the glass starts to splinter. It's L-shaped. So one of the winnebago's is on the cliff the other one is vertical and she's at the bottom of the vertical one on this pane of glass that is shattering beneath her it is absolutely thrilling it is perfect spielberg and it's the only thing worth watching really in this movie i'm sure there's videos of it on youtube that are worth checking out but then bo richard Schiff, who's still hanging out in the high hide with kelly he's like hey i need to go down and do something heroic in this movie and he shows up and saves everybody's ass he's the most heroic person in this entire movie yeah he's the only person that really gets it this raw in terms of being eaten by dinosaurs and is the least deserving of this treatment Vince Vaughn should have been the one to go, but, uh, you know. I agree with that, Uh, yeah. But, yeah, he ends up throwing a rope to them and tying it around this big stump, and then he throws a winch on the trailer and is trying to pull them up. But during that process, the T-Rexes come back and just crush the Jeep and eat him out of it. Like he's the delicious nougat center of a candy bar. There's one scene where he shows up and he ties up the rope, goes into the Winnebago that is horizontal, and then tosses the rope down into the one that's vertical and it's this long crane shot that i'm sure at the time where they were using arguably more practical effects is really well done Mm -hmm. with present day filmmaking all of this could be faked with cgi watching it in my opinion through the lens of this being a more practical effect it's a really cool shot that you can easily not acknowledge But it's very well done of how long it tracks from the outside of the Winnebago all the way down to where our heroes are in peril. Yeah. And, you know, one of my favorite things about this is eventually the trailers do end up sliding off. And because they're holding onto this rope, it just falls around them. Right. Because Richard Schiff is the most heroic motherfucker in this whole movie. Right. And he gets eaten. He just gets ripped in two. Why are you eating a good guy? Like in Jurassic Park movies, you eat the bad guys. Or like you're just like a worthless henchman. You don't eat good guys. Yeah. Dummies. Uh, Stupid Toby Hooper. Again, Toby <laughs> Hooper would do this right. It would be much bloodier. The dinosaurs would have had chainsaws. Oh, if only. And cocaine. Yeah, wait for it, ladies and gentlemen. So they, <laughs> they climb to the top finally and are helped up by ludlow and his band of no good necks who have finally tracked them down right so our bad guys in the movie show up to help our good guys in the movie is that what you're telling me yes well because they're looking for whoever it was that sabotaged them and rather than just be like well to hell with these guys let them fall off the cliff and our problems are over Pete postlethwaite tells them well your satellite equipment has been destroyed and since you've sabotaged all of us it looks like we're stuck on this island together peter stormari and and Vince Vaughn almost come to blows because they're the two least likable people in this movie. Hey, baby, what are you looking at? I don't know. What are you looking at? I don't know, baby. What are you looking at? It devolves into punch, smack, smack, punch. Hey, break it up, fellas. Break it up. Yeah. The two of you just met. Can't you just be friends? Imagine just meeting somebody in the jungle after you almost got eaten by a dinosaur. And the first words out of your mouth are, what the fuck are you looking at? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what the fuck are you looking at. I think he was just mad that he hasn't had much to do in this movie and then saw the rest of the script and realized he was never going to have that much to do in this movie. Ludlow, who's probably still drunk, he's like, Hey, everybody, I just remembered that if we go to this location at the center of the island, there's a telecommission doohickey majiba that we can call for a boat to come get us. Plus, guess what? That's where they've got more booze. <laughs> Tarara rum in me. Let's go, everybody. Party at Ludlow's place. It's just inside the Velociraptor's nest. Come on, you people first. Death awaits. Yeah, and Ludlow also says, by the way, 
There's something called a Velociraptor. They're going to be a big problem in a minute. Ted Nugent Jr. chimes in. He's like, hey, man, Velociraptors? Dude, these are the killer dinosaurs from the first movie. They are mean sons of bitches. What they will do, they will jump on you and they will rip your guts out. And when they do it, they will stare you in the eye and tell you how fat you are. That's right. They make you feel like shit even as they're eating you. And I know what you're going to think when they do this shit. You're going to look at them and you're going to say, clever girl. I swear to God, if you do that, your life is going to be miserable for the next eight minutes. <laughs> they hate it when you call them clever girl. Vince Vaughn and P. Postlethwaite have a little chat about how he wants to hunt the greatest predator the world has ever known. And Vince Vaughn's like, baby, baby, why do you want to do that? That seems like a whole lot of trouble. How about you just, you know, go hunt some buffalo or some of them lions down in Africa or something, baby. And he says... Well, it's a lot like that man who went up the mountain and almost died when he got to the bottom. They asked him, why did you do it? Why did you go up there to kill yourself? And he said, no, you've got it wrong. I went up there to live. Yeah, yeah baby, baby, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, and so Jeff Goldblum and Ludlow are also having a chit chat as they're marching towards this command center about how dumb Ludlow is. <laughs> And Jeff Goldblum says, look, Ludlow, uh, uh, taking dinosaurs off this uh, island is the worst in a long, sad history of uh, uh, bad ideas. And I'm going to be there when you learn that. Do you have any vodka? Uh, I, I do not. Could you make some for me? I can make some out of potatoes. Do you have any potatoes? I, uh, no. Do dinosaurs have potatoes? Um, I've got some dinosaurs around here somewhere. But it's like I, uh, uh, always say, uh, vodka, uh, finds a way. That's what I say. It finds a way into me liver. Oh, <laughs> get drunk. And so, uh, Pete Postlethwaite and his crew take a decide that they're going to take a break. Julianne Moore, by the way, shows that she has baby T Rex blood all over her shirt, which seems like maybe you would want to just get rid of that. But whatever, Julianne Moore. So Vince Vaughn has a seat beside her, and notably beside Pete Postlethwaite's big T Rex hunting gun. And we get a cutaway, but you know we know what's going on there. So Stromari, our lovable dimwit, he wanders off to take a shit in the woods and he gets lost. Lovable. <laughs> he falls down this hill to a creek below where he is immediately surrounded by compies. <laughs> Remember me? You shot me with the cattle prod. I brought my pals. Right. They go after him and he's calling to his buddy Carter, who A, wasn't listening to him in the first place because he was listening to some music and certainly doesn't care when the rest of the crew is like, hey, time to move out, everybody. Anybody see <laughs> Peter Storm? Now, you know what? Forget I even asked. I, I didn't want to finish that thought. <laughs> For some reason in this scene, when Stormari gets surrounded by these compies, they don't just kill him. They drag it out for two or three more scenes until he's finally done in by them yeah the, and it ends with him falling behind a log and you see all the compies descend on him and then the water flows red around the log and again the only people we have seen eaten so far by dinosaurs excluding the little girl from the beginning but we didn't see that we just heard it. is richard schiff good guy and hero of the movie richard schiff uh, yes. and peter stormari who we also do not see get killed also this is a bit of a spielberg cheat you know, it's like in Temple of Doom when that guy got crushed by the Rock Smasher. Or yeah. The Nazi boxer and Raiders. You just sort of see the trickle of blood. Like, oh, someone died over there off screen. It's a real bummer. And so P. Postlethwaite is asking Carter at a certain point, like, hey, what happened to Peter Stormare? Okay. Donde esta la biblioteca? <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. He just disappeared. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> Am I my Peter's keeper? The answer to that is no. <laughs> Pete Postlethwaite and Carter and another dude go looking for him. Pete Postlethwaite also tells Julianne Moore, because he's not a total villain in this movie. Like, he's got a weird fetish for hunting this dinosaur, but he's a responsible individual. And tells Julianne Moore, like, do not tell the little girl that we've got a man missing, you know? Like, like don't scare her any more than you gotta in this situation situation and so there's also a moment where ludlow tries to drunkenly rouse the troops to get them moving and they could not be less interested in following any orders from this knucklehead and finally vince vaughn is like hey baby uh, i'm sick of being out here in the jungle babies let's get uh let's get moving let's shake a tail feather and get to this command center what do you say babies so they're not following the drunk is what you're telling me. right which flies in the face of everything <laughs> i learned as a child chad <laughs> 
<laughs> Don't follow the drunk. Words to live by. <laughs> the whole crew makes a big camp at night, and there are puddles of water all around. Here we get a throwback to the glass of water where the footsteps of the T-Rex creates the ripples on the water's surface. But this time, Bo, it's even bigger because this is the sequel. Mm-hmm. And we cut to Julianne Moore, and she's in her tent with Kelly, the daughter. And Julianne Moore realizes that her shirt is covered in T-Rex blood. And that's how the dinos can find her, because of the blood stank. Mm -hmm. And then we get a redo of the dino head peeking in the tent. These T-Rexes like to peek into places, Winnebago's and trucks and tents. I think it's more a matter of we've got a fully articulated T-Rex head, so that's what we're, we're going to see. <laughs> you, we, we, we're going to use We it. paid for the head, we're going to shoot the head. The T-Rex sticks its head into the tent and gives it a... <laughs> and smells the blood-covered shirt. And then Kelly, the daughter, she wakes up and she's like, nom, nom, nom. what the... Ah! And Julia Moore slaps her hand over this kid's mouth to shut her up and jeff goldblum the whole time bo is outside watching all of this doing nothing mm -hmm. he's just watching it because he's like uh if if i run over and try to help them uh then the dinosaurs would eat me if i just stand here perfectly uh still then uh i'll probably live and hopefully my girlfriend and daughter will too but if they don't uh that's okay i'm quite the coxman uh i'll find a replacement life finds a way that's i, I trademark that that's my statement this dude carter wakes up that we've seen a number of times one of the most fleshed out characters among our villains even though he doesn't yes he doesn't say a word <laughs> but he wakes up and screams and now the whole camp is moving and running and screaming and the t-rex is chasing people p postlethwaite grabs his gun and is going to take a shot at the buck but yeah. they don't fire thanks to vince vaughn sabotaging his gun and he's like oh vince vaughn i'll get you the best part of this for me is when the dude gets stepped on. Yeah, it's Carter. Yeah, and you see the foot raise up and he's still stuck to the bottom of this T-Rex's foot. So, it's like bubble gum. Yeah, so he gets double <laughs> smooshed, which is pretty fun. Postlethwaite goes to his backup. He grabs a tranquilizer gun. He fires a couple of shots at the T-Rex. Kathunk, down it goes. Mm -hmm. And then a scene from the book Jurassic Park shows up in this movie where a bunch of our heroes, they hide behind a waterfall and a T-Rex bursts through the water to get at them and licks all over their faces. Ted Nugent Jr here and in a scene from one of the indiana jones movies a snake goes down his vest and he's like woo, woo, woo. so he freaks out and runs over and lands right in the mouth of the t-rex chomp 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 <laughs> r.i.p ted nugent jr and then jeff goldblum just bursts through the waterfall somehow bypassing the now belly full t-rex that was outside and he you know kind of saves julianne moore and i guess his daughter's there and maybe some other random characters that we don't have names for yeah and he thinks vince vaughn for say you know uh vince vaughn uh, uh thanks for uh saving my family did he i guess i mean he was in front when they were running i suppose <laughs> from jeff goldblum's standpoint that's an act of heroism i guess and so aj and his group are now in the tall grass and in fairness aj is telling people like don't run in the tall grass you idiots you mean over here no <laughs> he said run through the tall grass i did not say oh, all right i guess i'm with you guys too i don't want to be left behind make snow angels catch the grass seats on your tongue it's fun christmas time is here and the velociraptors poke their heads up and are like hey are we in this movie now i guess we are <laughs> hey let's go kill some people whose names do we nobody knows and whose don't matter come on fellas sounds good to me click click sharpen your claws it's showtime boys great all right let's do it and so <laughs> the velociraptors start chasing after these dudes and you just see people getting grabbed and falling into the grass and the velociraptors are jumping around and it's a bunch of characters that we don't know or care about are just getting eaten because all at the end of the day the lost world is just a slasher movie without any of the fun of a slasher movie where you see people getting slashed the scene with them going through the grass reminded me of that rogue farm robot from runaway yeah for sure most of them end up getting murdered our heroes are a little behind them and vince vaughn finds ajay's bag and he's like oh hey baby this is uh that boyfriend of pete postlethwaite what's his bag doing out here and then they hear just off in the distance ah! 
velociraptors. <laughs> run as fast as you can. That's what Jeff Goldblum tells them is to run as fast as you can. They do. They run through the grass and they get to the other side it's pretty non-dramatic and then they fall down this embankment into this boneyard and jeff goldblum sprains his ankle and it's real like owie 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 like he has a limp but it's not very pronounced it's the kind of limp you use to get out of pe because you hate playing dodgeball <laughs> right it, there's some flopping going on for sure it switches from one foot to the other at one point and you're like wait a minute right because vince vaughn is like hey baby we got to get this communication center who's up with me come on babies let's go uh why don't you go ahead and uh, uh i'll catch up in a little bit after uh you know i decide which ankle is actually uh uh, injured uh all right babies i'll see you later uh i'm only gonna be in this movie for about another 80 seconds so uh i guess i'll see you maybe we do another movie maybe jurassic park 3 whatever babies i'll see you then uh I, I don't think so baby uh baby why don't you just run ahead and turn the uh lights on uh and that's what he does he just runs to the command center and turns on the power and radios for help ludlow our drunken bad guy he's with possible quake somewhere and then we come back to jeff goldblum and his daughter kelly and julianne moore they show up at the now fully illuminated and although busted down and broken command center um they feel like hey this is operational enough let's have an action sequence and this whole set piece doesn't really need much description you could edit it out and it wouldn't mean shit to the movie bunch of velociraptors show up and then goldblum proceeds to get his ass kicked by a velociraptor not eaten or cut up or attacked he just gets the shit kicked out of him by a dinosaur he's using a door as a shield and this dinosaur does a like flying jump kick and hits him so hard it knocks him out the window behind him it's pretty fun it's pretty goofy julianne moore and kelly the daughter they run over and hide in this two-story utility shed and it's here that kelly uses her subpar gymnastic skills to swing around some bars and kick a velociraptor in the head and it's just stupid if you're a kid you might think hey this is fun to see another kid swing around and plant their feet into the skull of a dinosaur but for most people over the age of what like 11 it's just dopey it i do like the delivery of jeff goldblum saying and they uh kicked you off of the team this scene ends with a very indiana jones type of exit where julianne moore after tricking a velociraptor to fall off of a tiled roof which was clearly in my opinion the inspiration for a scene from jurassic world fallen kingdom anyway at the end of it julianne moore kind of tumbles through the floor and lands on a flat ceiling light which snaps off one end which leads to a somersault and she falls out a door and rube goldberg is there to high five her and she's just mad Magically in the next scene safe and sound buster keaton was the example that i used but yes then vince vaughn just pops up is like hey babies were you having an action scene without me it's fine hey i gotta uh, we gotta get to the chopper uh because uh the radio that i used we called in the cavalry sure and so they just get in this helicopter and fly off uh -huh. and vince vaughn surprising no one shows them that he's got these slugs from Pete Postlethwaite's rifle and basically he's like hey I got him baby he never saw this one coming but then we see Ludlow and his men below them around this captured T-Rex that they've got it's in this oversized cage and the T-Rex is snoozing because he's all drugged up Ludlow is on the radio saying hey we had a baby T-Rex down here he's also a big one and you need to come pick it up so take it to San Diego Chalala dinosaurs oh hey also the baby t-rex fell over and broke his leg i wasn't there when that happened at all he ran into a door and so <laughs> pete postlethwaite tells him aj didn't make it and this is the moment given the way that he says it is the moment where you're like oh i guess they were together but this movie just doesn't make that explicit which would make it at least more interesting real quick time check what time of day is it Two, three hours ago, everyone was asleep at camp. And Postlethwaite was like, we'll let them sleep for a couple of more hours. Then we'll wake them up and we'll let them get eaten by dinosaurs. So it's it's like four in the morning. It's been night for a long time. Yeah. And then the movie just cuts to this port where InGen has its own established location to import and export goods. And then a bunch of limousines show up with a bunch of fat cats crawling out of them in suits in the middle of the night to do something. I don't know it, how long it takes to get to the island to San Diego. 
which would be helpful. They mentioned that it was like two or three hours. Okay. Ludlow is here, and he's sobered up enough to make a speech. <laughs> well, I mean, he's sober enough, I think is the, the proper way to put it. And yeah, and he's like, this is the future of engine. Engine sounds like a racist term for Native Americans. Anyway, engine is going to do some fantastic stuff and there's a boat on the way and you're all going to love it. And meanwhile, Jeff Goldblum and Julianne Moore are trying to get into this press conference or whatever. They roll up in like a red Mustang convertible. You're just like, how did you get here in the car? It's 4.30 in the morning? Don't even worry about it. I know. Some meathead comes up to Ludlow and whispers in his ear, you, know, hey, you need to come see this. There's a ship headed directly for a port at a high rate of speed, like in speed two crease control. And he sees, Ludlow sees Julian Moore and Jeff Goldblum at the gate or whatever. And he's like, go ahead and let them in. I've got some crow I want them to eat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, when he gets to the control room or whatever, they're like, uh, yeah, boss, that's that ship uh that's carrying a tyrannosaurus rex my god what is that dot zipping towards the center of your radar it's moving at a quite a high rate of speed the center of that that's us that's me yeah that <laughs> look at that it the little dot I'm going to stick my head out the window. Can you see me wiggle it? Uh, it Hello? It's not that. that. Anyway, the dot that's moving at a high rate of uh, speed yeah. right toward you. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. the ship with the dinosaur. Oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah, that's what we said. That's why we called you. You're in charge, right? <laughs> not it. <laughs> it's, so the ship just crashes into the dock. Think about the feasibility of what you're talking about. This boat crashes, right? Mm -hmm. And when it finally comes to rest after all manner of destruction, Jeff Goldblum, Julianne Moore, Ludlow, and a random group of security officials, they go into the ship. And it's a ghost ship. Everyone has been killed. Mm -hmm. There are a few random arms hanging off of the steering wheel, and one of them's holding on to the button that makes the cargo hold open and close. None of this makes sense. I mean, I read online that scenes that were on the cutting room floor involved a bunch of velociraptors that's who killed everybody and yeah, that would make more sense yeah who steered this ship into this port it was on autopilot or something none of this makes any sense the problem i have with it it's so convoluted for an ending that doesn't matter right it's so forced to just have dinosaurs run around san diego for a while. right we had our velociraptor chase we had our t-rex chase and now we're going to another setting to do that again only not as much fun because you know what it is bo it's like those assholes that eat dinner at one restaurant and then leave and go have dessert at another restaurant <laughs> <laughs> just do it all in the same island you don't need to go to san diego to have your dessert it's unnecessary but here's a, here's my actual note is, is like they end up like releasing the cargo hold surprise surprise out comes the t-rex and it goes on a rampage and my note here is this movie just keeps going huh because that's what it feels like this uh like i said earlier this feels totally tacked on jeff goldblum at this point leans down to ludlow and says uh ludlow uh now you're john uh hammond who are you? Oh, <laughs> shit. I've got a dinosaur to capture. <laughs> Try la la drink some more. Julianne Moore says, the T-Rex is dehydrated. First, it will go for a water source. Then it will go to find its baby. So we cut to the T-Rex walking through the suburbs of San Diego. And it takes a drink from a swimming pool. And we see a family dog of the house. Pippet starts barking. Pippet! His collar Pippet! is attached to a chain, <laughs> which is attached to a doghouse. And inside the house is this kid who opens his eyes and sees the T-Rex doing what T-Rexes do best. Peek in windows, you pervert. And this kid gets up and goes to tell his parents that there's a dinosaur in his backyard. And Bo, these parents get up and they are screaming at each <laughs> other in a way that only two people who have unbeknownst to their respective partners contacted divorce attorneys in preparation for the inevitable. Well, also, neither of them give a shit about this kid or certainly don't respect him. No, it's a lot of like, you let him eat sugar at night. You let him watch those movies. I hate your mother. I hate you. I want a divorce. I wouldn't give you the goddamn satisfaction. This is because I asked you to have an abortion, isn't it? I didn't want one. I wanted a family. Well, look at what you got. Here it is. Here's your family i wanted a daughter not a son you think i had control over that what am i some genie that can make this stupid kid
kid of ours, a little girl. You think I wanted this asshole for a son? Nobody wanted this kid. <laughs> They're bitching and complaining. And then they look out the window and you see that the T-Rex has eaten the dog. What kind of movie eats the dog? That's not this movie. And then I was like, well, you know what? We ate Richard Schiff. We ate a dog. We're killing innocent heroes in their film. Absolutely. Yeah. And so Jeff Goldblum and Julianne Moore go to steal this Tyrannosaurus Rex baby. They just throw it at the back of their car. Yeah, it, well, it's being housed at the fake Jurassic Park amphitheater that the city had to have, what, ponied up like tens of millions of dollars in tax breaks to get built. And there's also nobody there. They just sort of stroll in and take it. A couple of guards show up and Jeff Goldblum's like, uh, if you want to shoot us, uh, just go ahead and do it. We're taking this dino, uh, sore, uh, yeah. And they drive off with the dinosaur. Right, because, you know, security is lax at best at this place. Maybe Vince Vaughn showed up and took their bullets. Probably. <laughs> Jeff Goldblum says, well, to uh, find the father, uh, we just need to follow the uh, screams. Cut to some woman screaming at 4.45 a.m. in San Diego. There's all kinds of people running around the streets. What are you doing out at this time of day? But anyway, the T-Rex runs alongside a city bus that's advertising Burger King Whoppers. We cut to inside a blockbuster video store where these large cutout standees, one of them's featuring Arnold Schwarzenegger and William Shakespeare's King Lear, which that's fun because Arnold isn't the kind of actor to make that movie, Bo. <laughs> I think this also might be a reference to a lyric in the song Variety Speak from the Animaniacs show that was produced by Spielberg. In it, it talks about Schwarzenegger being in King Lear. I thought it was a clever reference to The Last Action Hero. You know, maybe. There's another standee featuring Robin Williams in a movie called Jack and the Beanstalks, uh -huh. which I was like, is that like Robin Williams in that movie Jack? Uh -huh. Where he was that kid who grew old, like some sort of high-speed reverse Benjamin Button. But then there's another one for Tom Hanks in a movie called Tsunami Sunrise. And I was like, these aren't even jokes. Like, this is just stupid. You, Steven Spielberg never knew that these were in the movie. This was all production designers having their little goofs. And Steven Spielberg didn't look at it twice. Didn't care. Was not paying attention. I think you're talking about the final cut. Anyway, the, the city bus crashes into this blockbuster video store that's only here for these sight gags. And then there's a shot of a bunch of Asian tourists running away from the T-Rex like a Godzilla movie. It's bad. Running alongside them is the movie Screenwriter david kep mm -hmm. and he's uh pretending to you know be scared and shitting his pants and then he gets eaten and he's credited as unlucky bastard in the film's credits yeah good for you collect both those checks man so julianne moore wakes up the baby dinosaur uh, so that it'll make some noise and now the big dinosaur hears it and is giving chase by my count chad we have eight minutes left in the movie which is great we're wrapping this one up fast yeah and so jeff goldblum drives around some buildings and then through some warehouses to get to the waterfront where the ship is ludlow is on his car phone telling people you know uh, just shoot the big T-Rex, not the baby. Don't shoot the baby. What's it, you, some kind of a dinobortionist? Oh, I just came up with that. Dinobortion. You're probably from Texas. They loved abortions. And killing people, America. I'm so tired. Do you have Taco Bell in Santiago? <laughs> I can go for a gordita. Donde esta Taco Bell? That's what the guy taught me back on East Sauna. Yo quiero Tyrannosaurus. That's what I want. Como se dice? It has the zoot. <laughs> so he sees Jeff Goldblum and Julianne Moore drive by him. So he gives chase. Jeff Goldblum and Julianne Moore throw this baby dinosaur in the hull of this ship and just jump over the side. It's a real Butch and Sundance move. Fall will probably kill you. Ludlow <laughs> follows him and doesn't understand any of what's happening around him. So he goes down into the cargo hold after the baby T-Rex. <laughs> Not understanding that the actual adult T-Rex has followed him in because it apparently snuck down the steps. And so he tries to get up the stairs and the T-Rex just grabs him and kind of slings him around and uses this as a teachable moment for the baby T-Rex so it can learn <laughs> how to hunt. 
<laughs> and, and it eats Ludlow. Yeah. R.I.P. Ludlow. And so Julianne Moore and Jeff Goldblum climb back on the ship. Jeff Goldblum closes the cargo hold. And Julianne Moore uses the tranquilizer gun to knock out the T-Rex. Then we go to the very last scene of this movie, which yeah. is just a news report of the ship returning to the island. Being anchored by Bernard Shaw. Remember him mm -hmm. from the Gulf War? <laughs> oh, do I ever? <laughs> Star of the Gulf War? <laughs> Sitting there with your dad and his lucky rock watching CNN. <laughs> I hope they bomb all those. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Don't finish that sentence, Dad. I'll finish what I, I'll finish this bottle. Uh, yeah, yeah, you will. You'll show that booze what for. And <laughs> so Julianne Moore and Jeff Goldblum are passed out asleep. Not that they have much to say to each other anyway. And then Kelly is awake and she's watching as Bernard Shaw throws to John Hammond, uh -huh. who is saying, we need to preserve and isolate this island. These creatures don't require our intervention. They require our absence. As a wise man once said, who is asleep on a couch somewhere right now, I guarantee you, he said, life finds a way. Cut to the island where we just see a bunch of dinosaurs roaming around together in a shot that is only missing Jesus in the center of it to be a painting yeah. that you would find on a hotel room wall. But then a pterodactyl swoops down, lands on a branch and... Ah, Jurassic Park! How did this movie not set up a part three? Because somebody would have had to have cared. Good point. <laughs> they, they would have had to have thought, hey, let's do this a third time. And it turns out, I think what they'd all discovered in making this movie was that they never should have done it a second time. But if that were the case, we wouldn't have had the other four movies and soon to be five six seven eight nine uh, yeah that is the end of not only the lost world colon jurassic park it is the end of our entire season i know season 21 right in the middle with you yep <laughs> and as we always do like we always do about this time it's time mm -hmm. that we rank the movies that we discussed this season do you want to go first i've got my ranking right in front of me and they're all tied for last i don't think i've ever gone first in 20 seasons i don't think i've ever gone first i think you should go first oh, i'm so nervous all right i'm gonna go from bottom to top okay that's how i've got mine listed too at the bottom timeline is my mm -hmm. bottom. It just because it's boring and it's just it's long and it's just terrible. Yeah. Congo is my number five. Uh -huh. There are some things that I like about Congo, but there's more that I don't like. I like watching that monkey get drunk. <laughs> I like watching the gorillas cannonball into the lava. Uh huh. That monkey's got a lucky rock, I bet. <laughs> but, but for the most part, it's pretty unwatchable. Yeah. But because of all of the, the monkey shenanigans, it's better than Timeline. Number four is Rising Sun. Mm -hmm. It runs a little too long. It's way too pre with trying to educate me to japanese culture my number three is runaway i enjoyed runaway i like tom Selleck's mustache it's a lot of fun my number two surprisingly is lost world it's fast paced it's bananas it's dinosaurs eating people and my number one you won't be surprised is Westworld. i think i have a soft spot for yule brenner hunting down and wanting to kill richard benjamin we are somewhat similar all right in last place at number six we agree that timeline is the absolute worst <laughs> sure <laughs> Boy, what a bad, bad movie. Number five, also Congo for me, for all of the reasons that you mentioned. Number four for me is Lost World, because even though it is not terribly long and the plot moves along, nothing happens really, and the, the characters are terrible. And also, no one puts a bag over a dinosaur's head and tries to have sex with it on a boardroom table. Yeah, right. And that Which brings me to my number three, Rising Sun, because I like <laughs> chokers. And then number two is Westworld world yep and number one for me is runaway because runaway is really goofy but i find it to be a lot of fun and i think better directed than westworld even though they're kind of uh, like either of those are kind of of a stripe yeah and i could watch westworld or runaway again without too much pain everything else on the list is varying degrees of bad i think westworld and runaway are okay i'm not as crazy about westworld as you are but i could watch it again there there's interest interesting stuff about Westworld for sure. Yeah, I completely agree. I've enjoyed this season because of the variety of films that we've dealt with, you know, sci-fi and noir mysteries and dinosaurs killing people and monkeys 
cannonballing into lava mm-hmm. and time travel. It's been a really diverse season. But, Bo, I got to tell you, mm-hmm. the other day, I'm driving home, and around the corner from my house, there's this abandoned 24-hour fitness. And, Bo, it's turned into a spirit Halloween store. And, Bo, mm. that means it's time for us to dip our toes back into your favorite genre of film, horror movies. And for our 22nd season, the theme is going to be Deja Vu, <laughs> where we will, we will be featuring six remakes of horror movies that inspired iconic franchises over the past few decades. And to kick things off, Bo, would you care to introduce what will be showing up for the inaugural episode of this new and improved season? Absolutely. It is time for us to journey to Long Island, (laughs) specifically Amityville, where we are going to look at not the original Amityville horror, but the remake with Ryan Reynolds and Melissa George and try to figure out why on earth they would ever do that. And you might sense that that will be a theme of the season of (laughs) remakes of movies that are pretty good and then they did it again. You know, way back in season eight, we did six remakes and I intentionally talked to you about how I did not want to do a compare and contrast of old versus new. Mm -hmm. But in this season, we're really going to dive into how so many of these classic horror movie remakes pick and choose what they want to leave in, what they want to take out, and these new elements that they force into a known iconic film to try to set this new version apart from the original. And I think it's going to be fun. I think it's going to be scary. I think it's going to be season 22, Deja the deuce deuce (laughs) so as always if you like the podcast like rate review tell a friend leave us a comment you can find us on social media some of you reach out and send us emails at uh pick six movies at gmail.com that's uh s-i-x not the number six the people have the six they always complain that they get our email so please don't do that but send us an email drop us a line let us know what you think we're getting ready to move into the halloween season which will be a lot of fun and we've got a lot of classic 70s and 80s horror movies that produce some wonderful franchises that you know and love and i think if you really spend about eight seconds you'll know pretty much all six movies that we're going to be discussing in uh the upcoming season but any final thoughts that you have on the lost world colon jurassic park chet chet uh uh that velociraptor just uh shit like a dog (laughs) ah it's uh scratching the grass to cover it up uh life uh truly does find uh, a way (laughs) we'll see you all in season 22 in two weeks time